Uh, yes, I'll have the little prelude in C major, please. Uh, does that come with fingering? Oh, it does? Oh, great, yes. And motives, too? Oh, wonderful. I'll have that. Thank you. <laughs> well, hi there. It's me, Penny. Welcome back to my office. I've put up a few performance videos lately, and so I figured it was high time that I got back to making a tutorial for you. And I thought, what better piece to do one for than the one that you just heard me perform in a previous video? And that, of course, is the Little Prelude in C Major, BWV 939 by Mr. B. <laughs> and uh, it's it's light fare, right? It's a, it's, it's not an entree. It's a sort of a appetizer, if you will. <laughs> and, uh, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have its own challenges. Now, this piece is extremely popular. It's played more times than I could ever guess, and it is a, a, a staple of the intermediate repertoire, I think, for most, uh, for most teachers. And, uh, it poses a few interesting um, challenges, and um, I want to start off by talking about one of those challenges, which is fingering. Now, in a recent tutorial, I talked about the fingering I use for, uh, I think it was the F major invention number eight, and I'm going to do along the, go along the same lines here with this piece and show you my fingering for this piece because it occurred to me that because this piece is so triadic, it's, it's got a lot of movement by thirds, triads, um, that it could almost be played entirely with fingers one, three, and five. And perhaps you use that fingering yourself, or maybe you have a student who is uh, n inclined to use those same fingers through the majority of this piece. However, that may be easy <laughs> to do, but it does not promote uh, bounce and vigor and expression in the music, I don't think, anyway. Um, because this music has so much up and down motion. So I'm going to show you my um, fingering here on the page. And this time I've changed the colors up. We have the right hand in red, the left hand is in green. You know, we're getting into the holiday spirit here. <laughs> and uh, the there's a lot of um, use of the, the fourth finger. And so you can see here my fingering um, for the right hand on top, left hand on the bottom. And in that opening bar where we have a triad, uh, I'm willing to bet that most students would play it with one, three, five, three, one, five, three, and then maybe throw in a four in measure two, um, but generally use a lot of one, three, and five. But you can see here that I'm using uh, one, two, four for that opening triad. And uh, same thing in measure three for the G major triad. Um, as well for the left hand when it comes in in measure four with the same material or nearly the same material. We don't have the B flat there. Um, and I find that this fingering as a whole allows me to eliminate or minimize <laughs> any bumps along the road. I think the worst thing, and that is the reason for this fingering that I've chosen. I revised this fingering a few times over the course of making that performance video I just put up last week. And it was largely because I kept getting bumps from my thumb and then from the top, the outside of my hand when I went to play these, these motives. Um, and I found that this fingering allowed me to minimize the bumpiness and therefore achieve greater uh, continuity of the overall line um, of, of these, um, of the right hand part and the left hand part. Of course, this is not a fugue. This is um, imitative music, yes, but it's not strict. And I'll show you uh, some motives I listened for in a moment. But I really found, especially in the right hand measure six there, um, 
I was getting some unwanted bumps, getting from my thumb on the G up to the high E. Um, and so I used one, two, four for that. And uh, in the left hand as well, measure four. Um, this kind of fingering, as I say, eliminates bumpiness and notiness too, for that matter. But also, it just plain feels good. And what was it? Anton Rubinstein, the great pian Russian pianist, said that, uh, you know, play with your nose if you must, but produce euphony, music, sounds that please the ear. And uh, bumps in this music do not please my ear. <laughs> and so uh, uh, this is the fingering that works for me. It feels good. It eliminates bumpiness. It allows me to hear uh, polyphonic lines, multiple lines of, of, uh, of theme, thematic material. And it also promotes constant movement of the hand. I talked about that in uh, the recent tu tutorial for the F major invention about how it's so important to have constant movement of the body. It doesn't mean it's got to be like really vigorous movements, but just subtle little, little bits of movement from the bridge of the hand, the wrist, the arm. And when the hand moves, the arm follows. And actually, in some cases, the arm is like the driver. It drives the bus <laughs> and the hand just sort of follows. Um, for instance, the 16th notes there in measure 14 that the right hand has. Um, I like to try to create a kind of swirl, like, like if you imagine water going down a drain really quickly, you know, like a cyclone. I like to create that kind of effect in certain passages, and these 16th notes are one of them. Um, and so, th because I want such a, a powerful swirl <laughs> to that gesture, um, and the arm is a lot stronger than the fingers in the hand, I find it helpful to kind of, as I say, drive the bus, as it were, <laughs> with your upper arm. Um, but, but this fingering certainly is the main thing that I want to show you here in this portion of the video. Um, the left hand, as I say, is doing similar things to the kind of fingering I chose in the left hand. It's always for the sake of creating clear articulation um, that, is, that is not just clear, but that has a warm tone, an energized tone. The other thing, too, is that this opening motive that the right hand has and again, I've got my sheet with motives here. I'll get to that. Um, but it begins with an eighth rest. And so each time we have this little motive, we want to energize it. And using fingering that promotes constant movement of the hand will help to energize your tone. You know, I have been very lucky over the course of many years of playing. I started lessons when I was seven. <laughs> And um, I've never had any tendonitis or cramping or pain, hand pain, back pain, whatever, um, that so many people have. And uh, I consider myself very fortunate. I can knock on wood here because I don't want to jinx that by saying it on camera. But it's true. And I think a lot of that has to do with having had some very good teachers who made me aware of how to use the body and of the importance of uh, exercising too, going for a walk, uh, getting some oxygen in your lungs, and stretching before you play. I get on the floor and I do a whole bunch of different exercises, as well as exercises on the piano before I play anything. I never just dive in and start practicing the pieces. Um, I think it was Vladimir Horowitz who who said, uh, "If if you don't, if I don't walk." I can't run on the keys, <laughs> and I love that. Um, but these things are very important. Uh, constant movement, it feels good, and it sounds good. The, there are some yellow circles that I've put on this fingering diagram, and those indicate places where I'm doing a finger substitution. 
and I made a video, I don't know, a year or so ago when I was fairly new to making videos, and I talked about finger substitution. So you can watch that. I'll, I'll link to it uh, for you. And um, But we have the, those moments circled in yellow. Uh, the first one is in the right hand. I'm sorry, the left hand measure six, uh, playing the G with a three, and then I use the little slash followed by a one. So that means when you see the slash, uh, that means to substitute uh, fingers. So in this case, uh, three substituted by one. Now, uh, and we got, there's a few of them, the right hand in measure seven, three to four. There's a kind of sophisticated one at the end of measure seven, because it's a chord. We got four, two, one. And as I'm s parked on those keys, finger four is being substituted by five, and finger two is being substituted to three. And there's a few more uh, of these in the piece. Um, Finger substitutions are, I think, essential in Bach because while, while we are certainly allowed and encouraged, I think, to use the pedal when playing Bach, we also don't want to overdo it because this music has so many layers. Maybe not this piece. This is an easier piece. It's just got two parts. Um, but when we get into inventions, symphonias, fugues, um, we want to be able to hear those three voices or four voices um, participating in a, in a dialogue. That's something my teacher, Constance Keen, used to say. You know, a Bach fugue is, is, a, is a dialogue, not a monologue. So you want to have clarity and, and equal um, levels of sound so that we can hear the bass, the tenor, the soprano, and the alto. And finger substitutions allow you to do that. They also allow you to uh, prepare for what's coming next. Um, uh, allows you to avoid having to pick up the hand and place it and move it down. You know, you can just do a, it's, it's like the, what is it? The, the snake, you know how a snake slithers? <laughs> it's kind of this, the same thing. And, uh, and it feels really good. Um, Rosalind Churek, I remember watching some videos of her. Of course, she was a very fine Bach pianist. Uh, f over the summer, I shared a, a rare interview that one of my teachers had done with her. Uh, maybe I'll include that as a card as well for you to check out. But she did, used to do a lot of finger substitutions. Um, it's essential in playing Bach, even in these little, little preludes. So that uh, is my fingering and you're welcome to use it as i've said before and i'll say time and time again fingering is a personal choice you have to play and use the fingers that feel good to you and that allow you to produce beautiful <laughs> euphony at the piano right sounds that please the ear <laughs> Even if it means using your nose, this is important. And uh, again, my teacher, Constance Keen, used to say, uh, with regards to the fingerings that we find in our scores put in by an editor, uh, scrape them away. <laughs> Maybe they're helpful some of the time, but chances are the editor had a very different shaped hand from you and I. Um, we all come in different shapes and sizes, so you got to find what works for you. And don't be scared to try a, a fingering that may seem bizarre. You never know. You could surprise yourself. Um, in measures 9, 10, and 11, the left hand has a bunch of mordants, a uh, little decoration that goes down a step and back. So G, F sharp, G. And for those in my left hand, I'm fingering them each mordant as one, three, two, one, three, two. It's possible that an intermediate student may um, naturally be inclined to play that as one, two, one, or one, three, one, which certainly works. <laughs> um, however, and, and this is especially true if you're planning to play this piece a little bit at a more brisk tempo, as, as I did in my previous video, 
those mordants, at least I think, need to be tight and, and, and shiny and bright and brilliant, like, like sparkling gold buttons on a, on a, maybe on a military jacket. You know, you, when you notice shiny buttons, ah, <laughs> right? Mordants in this case, nice and tight and quick and clean and right on the beat. And I just find that if I use the same finger, uh, j j just two fingers, like one, two, one, or one, three, one, the, the mordant, uh, the, the button is not so shiny and bright. It's sort of like off, kind of dull. But by using a different finger for each note of the mordant, oh, they're almost like little electrical currents. If Now, if this were a, um, like a Sarabande or a, maybe the Aria of the Goldberg variation, something slower, um, it, you wouldn't want that same kind of bzz, bzz, kind of electrical exciting jolt of sound you'd want maybe a more languid lyrical you know uh, lugubrious kind of fluid kind of kind of sound and it would be a, a more broad uh, mordant and similarly if you choose to play this piece in a slow fashion you can uh, adjust your mordants accordingly and and i did try this piece at a number of tempos um but <laughs> The slow one uh, was not allowing me to achieve what I heard in my mind, and nor did the medium speed tempo. So I, I played it quite quickly. And in that case, with a quick tempo, I like my mordants tight and quick. Whew, it's very satisfying, I find. And so using one, three, two allowed me to get nice tight mordants. Um, I also added a little uh, turn with a mordant at the very end, the second last note of the right hand part and so that's why you see all those <laughs> extra fingerings there four three four three two three anyhow i hope that this is helpful um use whatever of this is is useful to you <laughs> share it if you like and uh yeah i've I, i've got my mordants here to show you but why don't we do like we did in the last tutorial and take a little break <laughs> We're calling this a lesson, so let's take a little lesson break. And I've got some more B-roll footage, or maybe I should say Mr. B-roll footage, uh, to show for you. This is some footage from a drive that I took in Niagara on the Lake uh, on the Niagara Parkway, which Winston Churchill, Sir Winston Churchill, uh, once remarked uh, something to the tune of it was the most beautiful Sunday drive in the world. <laughs> it really is a beautiful ride. And so let me show you some footage from that, and then we'll get back to this little prelude. And so here we are driving along Niagara Parkway in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario. And this footage was taken at the beginning of November. Uh, right now we're at the very end of November. So this footage has been uh, in the icebox, so to speak, waiting to be used in a tutorial. I think it's nice to take a little break now and then. And uh, this particular day was a really beautiful one, sunny and the the leaves were, well, half off the trees, maybe a little more than half off the trees. And many more have, uh, they've just about all fallen now. But actually, a week or so ago, we got dumped on. We got a horrible blizzard. Buffalo, New York got it really bad. But we got uh, almost as bad. It was a, a few feet of snow all in one day. It just came down nonstop, and I was... I shoveled three times in one uh, day, just in the span of, a, I don't know, eight hours or so. <laughs> and, oh, it was icy and, and the snow was heavy. Um, but it's all gone now. <laughs> and uh, But sure enough, we'll be getting some more shortly. But you can see, or maybe you've noticed already, on the right-hand side is the Niagara River. There you can see a little bit. And on the other side of that, is New York State. Uh, I think Lewiston, New York is the nearest town to where we're driving right now. And then on the left side are the many wineries and orchards and fruit farm stands, which are closed, many of which are closed now, but absolutely beautiful 
and uh, you need some money to live out here, that's for sure. <laughs> but a nice break. All right, so we're back from our little break here at our lesson on this little prelude in C major, <laughs> and we're going to talk about motives. Now, uh, what I mean by motives, rather, uh, let's, I need to be clear with this, uh, because I am not a music theorist that is not my training or profession. I'm a pianist <laughs> with some theory knowledge, but these motives, uh, these are the notes that I am listening for. And if you ever hear me singing, I try to keep it to a minimum, but usually you can hear a little bit of, of it when I'm playing. And my what I'm singing is usually the notes that I'm that I'm listening for as kind of anchor notes. And by singing a single note that I think is is important, more structurally speaking. Uh, it allows me to hear it because I can sing that note as I'm playing other notes. And it by singing, it reinforces that structural element. It keeps it somehow grounded. And I don't know if it actually, I think it makes a difference. <laughs> but again, like with the fingering, it feels good. And uh, if it feels good and sounds the way I want it to, well, then you, you can bet your booties that I'm going to continue doing, doing those, those, uh, those techniques. But here we have, and I'm going to show it on the screen for you, uh, those notes that I'm listening for. And uh, as with the previous tutorial where that came out around Halloween and I had some pumpkins and witches and bats and <laughs> other critters on, on the sheet. Uh, now we are into the more colder temperatures. And so, uh, well, we need some treats, right? Uh, and we got our little gingerbread man, a couple of cookies, some cake, and uh, hot chocolate, of course. <laughs> Good to have when you're practicing. You know, Mr. B liked food and the man liked to eat. I mean, just look at a picture of him. His those chunk, chunky cheeks. <laughs> I'm sure he would, have eaten any of these little snacks here. Um, but here we've got uh, the motives, the notes I'm listening for. And this sheet music that you've been seeing all along in this video, this is the Breitkopf and Hertel edition that I found on the IMSLP site, which of course is free to access. Well, it's a wonderful resource. So uh, we have, let's start with the purple well, they look more like pink, but uh, I thought it was purple at the time. The purple lines, those are the main lines. Those, are, those lines connect to the notes that I'm listening to more than any other notes, with perhaps the exception of those pedal points in the left hand. We have a tonic pedal uh, in measures one through three, that's on C. You certainly want to keep that note in your ear. You could even listen, you could even sing that if you wanted to really hear it. We have a dominant pedal, uh, measure nine, 10, and 11, and then measure 14, a subdominant pedal. Um, but those purple lines, that's what I want to get at here. Now, this opening little, this first thing you hear in the piece um, is, it's kind of like a subject of a fugue. We begin with this little rest, and then we have these um, this broken triad. Da dee da dee da 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 da. We get it three times in a row, each time uh, a step. Uh, the, the the each time the last note is a step higher, with the exception of the the third one, but. Basically, those groups of three purple lines, those three note motives, they're moving up um, each time. So let's start with the brown lines. <laughs> and uh, these are just little squared off brackets that I put to indicate each uh, entry of this We'll call it a subject for lack of a better word. This is not a fugue. Um, we don't have a strict subject and uh, strato and thing, fugal techniques like that, but it is basically a, a little subject. And we get it uh, measure one, and then we get it measure two, we get it again in measure three. 
And then the left hand has a turn. Measure four, measure five, few bars later, left hand, right hand, right hand has it a whole bunch of times in a row. You can see there's a lot of brown brackets. Each one of those is a little statement or a little entry of this subject. And you want to be aware of that and energize those entries, particularly the first note of each of those brown <laughs> brackets. And you can do that by using the fingering and uh, ample rotation so that you can get your finger, it's, it's usually the thumb, sometimes the fifth finger, but getting that finger onto the key enough, not just grazing it with the tip, but rotating enough so that a good firm chunk of that finger can be articulating those entries. Uh, and that does require rotation from the wrist, like a hinge on a door or those architect lamps that you clip on your desk and you know the, the arm. <laughs> you can rotate it a little bit like that. Rotation at the piano is important. So we got all those entries, and then the last uh, three notes of those entries are what I've put in purple lines. And those really are the notes. Those purple lined notes are the ones that I'm listening for with the most concentration in my mind, particularly the third note of those three note We'll call them little motives. So the first three note motive is B flat G A. There, as we cross the bar line at measure one and two. So A is the last note of that. And then the second group of those purple three note motives is C A B natural. So the B natural, I'm listening for that. Previously we had the A, so we're going A to B natural. And then the third set of the purple three note motives, <laughs> we've got F, D, E. So the third note of each of those motives, A, B natural, and E. That's what I'm listening for. And those notes, I'm, well, I'm, I'm listening for everything in purple, but it's those third notes of those three note motives that I'm listening for even more. And I'm trying to give those notes more depth of tone so that they sing, that they speak more, that they ring like a bell, particularly when it's a long note. So you see in the first two of those three note purple blobs, <laughs> uh, the, the third note is an eighth note. In the third one, the third note is a half note. And that is the case in the next one and then, and then a, another one later on. So sometimes they end with a half note, sometimes they end with an eighth note. And when they end with a half note, you can, again, bet your, bet your uh, not booties this time, bet your buttonholes <laughs> that th those half notes are going to get much more uh, arm weight and uh, uh, participation from my back muscles. That's, that's what I'm personally doing so that those notes can be cushioned and sing uh, more fully than the eighth notes. And then of course the left hand has this going on as well. Measure, uh, what is it, eight. Uh, we got a half note. Uh, measure six, it ends on a half note as well. So in that case, the thumb is uh, giving good fullness of tone. Yeah, so you can hear this movement by step or more or less by step, this ascent of these uh, three note purple blobs. And I have here uh, to, to try to convey um, what I hear because what a lot of times what I hear is like, something that I see <laughs> and then I sort of translate into sound. And if you think of a, a rubber band, you know, that's not limp and, and just flaccid like that, but that's just moderately taut, I feel like that is my general uh, state of um, 
energy in terms of my fingers and my tone and touch. And then with each of these successive statements of those three note motives, those little purple blobs, especially when they go up and then the next one up and then the next one up again, I'm, what I'm hearing is the equivalent of that rubber band in its resting place getting a little bit more taut and then a little bit more, much more taut, right? And you have to try to find a way to hear an in intensification of tone. It's hard to do. And uh, I certainly wasn't doing it in my early days of playing from the Royal Conservatory graded books, not at all and probably not even in my undergrad. I think it was more masters and certainly in the doctoral studies. And then after that, because we don't stop learning after we go to school. <laughs> um, I think it's when we finish school that we realize how much we don't learn and how we better get on top of things and s really you know, start, start learning to keep it going. But this to me is just a wonderful analogy. And Bach does tend to repeat things a lot. <laughs> we saw that in the invention as well. And, and when he repeats something, you can think of the first time as this rubber band in its comfortable state. And with each statement, it gets a little bit more stretched. This expansion and contraction, never expanding so much that it snaps and breaks on you, or that it's just limp and loose, but that it's tight and firm and gets pushed and pulled as you go. And uh, so repetition of motives, whether they're melodic or rhythmic, you can do, you can think about the rubber band, you can use that analogy, and also with intervals. So if, if you have, if you're moving by step, you know, the notes are just next to each other, um, or even by third, perhaps, then it's kind of like the relaxed state rubber band. But as the intervals get wider and you're moving by fourth and fifth, maybe sixth as well, then it gets a little tighter. And then you get to sevenths and octaves, maybe even a ninth. And then, whoo, <laughs> the uh, rubber band is really stretched. And we have to think of this with intervals, especially because uh, as pianists, technically, Technically, I mean, this piece took me, what, less than a minute to play. I could almost play the whole thing if I wanted to, and I don't want to, but I could almost play the whole piece by without breathing. If I took a deep breath and held it, I could probably get through the whole piece. And if I played it really fast, I definitely could. But that's foolish and silly. But it's one of the dangers of being a pianist is that we literally don't have to to breathe, to play. We can hold our breath and play a scale and, and the notes are still there. But a singer, a singer can't make sound unless they're breathing. And to sing a wide interval takes a lot more breath and support and energy than to just go movement by step. Of course, I'm just generalizing. I, by no means am I a singer, but I have worked with a lot of singers and uh, sat in on their lessons and so picked up a few things. And um, it's the same application at the piano. So uh, those motives, certainly be on, the, be on the hunt for them. And you can see how I diagram these with the double stems. That is my general method for marking in notes that I want to hear, uh, that I view as being more structurally uh, in integral to the, to the architecture of the piece. Um, and and, and uh, it's a nice, I guess I'm a visual learner, and so that helps. Um, the left hand too, uh, measure five, six, seven, it's going up uh, uh, by step. Um, and then uh, right hand, the end of measure eight, and then nine, 10, 11. That to me is the real climax of the piece because we have this dominant pedal in the left hand with the mordants. <laughs> and for that whole time, the right hand is repeating the subject with those, um, and we're listening for those, those three note motives, each one C, A, B, F natural, D, E, 
G, E, F sharp, and then finally A, F sharp, G in measure 12. And that is a significant arrival. And that's where your, at least my <laughs> musical rubber band, is at its maximum capacity. <laughs> um, that first statement of it at the end of measure eight, you know, it's, it's, it's tight. And then measure nine, 10, 11, 12. But it's, it's that kind of thing. And if you can kind of hear sounds that are repeated with this like quietly bubbling intensity over time, each one a little bit more, each one a little bit more than, than the most, <laughs> then it really, helps to create a kind of a story, a, a, a high points and low points. Because the most boring thing uh, is to hear this music where all the notes are played correctly, the rhythms are played correctly, but everything is like it's come off a assembly line. Everything is played with the exact same level of force and volume, and it's just they're, they're all... They're all the same. Sameness is boring in music, I think. And these are just some general tools and tips that I use when I'm playing Bach. And even though this is only an intermediate piece, it's just like not even a page <laughs> long, it actually provides a wonderful um, launching point for these essential techniques uh, of listening in order to play polyphonic music um, with, with pizzazz, how about? <laughs> At least I like to think I get some pizzazz out of the piano. Um, some people would, would beg to differ, <laughs> but we gotta do what works for us. And so on that note, I'm gonna wrap up this tutorial. <laughs> I hope that it was helpful, and I plan to uh, have, have some more coming up soon. And so feel free to leave a comment. If something here was helpful, I would love to know. If you have suggestions or um, questions, leave me a comment, please. I would love to hear from you. And uh, in the meantime, uh, stay well, <laughs> happy practicing, and we'll see you again soon for some more performances and teaching tips for the music of Mr. B. <laughs> Take care and thanks for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>